Love Bones, I'll share just for about 20 minutes and then have a little time for questions. And what we should do is pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us because as I myself try to teach these truths, God makes me realize how much I need them in my own life. And that's good that we sense that that's the situation, but I want you to see then that we need the Holy Spirit, therefore, to teach us all, that none of us can teach the other, really, about these things. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, will you be kind to teach us tonight so that we will each one understand? Holy Spirit, we would ask you to take us beyond what any human being can teach us, and you impress the truths in our own spirits, so that we may not only gather knowledge this evening, but may receive life and may be able to express it during the coming days to others. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. <coughs> Loved ones, what we're uh, going to try to talk about this evening is the dividing of the soul from the spirit. A lot of us have joked about the division of soul and spirit a lot over the years because I've been flogging it to death for about seven or eight years now. But I think that many of us are coming into sufficient maturity uh, spiritually to see how vital it really is and what a lifetime experience it is this dividing of the soul from the spirit, and really how important it is to have the soul divided from the spirit if we're going to minister Jesus' life at all. And I would just point out to you, oh, a chapter, thanks, Ron, a chapter in, in 1 Corinthians, if you would like to look at it, that I think we looked at very briefly once before. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it is, and Paul is talking about his own ministry, and that's what we're really talking about when we're discussing the importance of having the soul divided from the spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 and 10, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Now, the work that Jesus' Spirit is able to do through you in your own life, in building people into Jesus himself, the kind of work that you do will be determined by the degree to which your soul is under the control of your spirit. So you can get all kinds of Christian works going today, but much of them are wood, hay, or stubble. That is, they are loved ones whose conversions do not last. Or if the conversions seem to last, there is no fruit flowing from the converts. And then there is the other kind of work that is done by people whose souls are governed by their spirits, and that is the kind of work that is likened to precious stones. And it is solid work that remains. It is members, it consists of members of the body of Jesus who bear fruit and are ongoing and advancing in Jesus and in victory. And really, loved ones, it's the same for all of us in this room. The kind of work that we're producing is determined by the extent to which our souls are governed by our spirits and to the extent to which they're still being governed by the habits they learn from the body. And I would just remind you that that is the problem we have. The soul is like 
a little man that has been governed by this huge body for years. And this little uh, Irishman here was dead because he's green. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was dead at the very beginning. And that was the situation, you know, the, the great body governed the soul and determined what the soul would experience. And the soul, you remember, those of us who have been together at least during these teachings uh, since September, the soul consists of the psychological part of us, the mind and emotions and the will. And that's the situation with the natural man. That is the man or woman who knows nothing about God. That's how their personality works. Their spirit is dead, so there's nothing coming from there at all. And their body utterly governs their soul. And I could give you easy examples, but the great majority of people today are utterly dominated by their need for food, shelter, and clothing. And most of the three and a half billion minds in our world tomorrow morning will be concentrating on how to get more food, more shelter, or more clothing. That's it. Their minds will be utterly dominated by the needs of their bodies. And the tragedy is that millions of loved ones, our dear brothers and sisters, will never live any differently from that. That's tragic. There are millions that will never live any differently from that. They'll live and they'll die after 70, 75 years of life with the body governing the soul and their mind little better than the mind of a little animal just trying to get more food, more shelter, more clothing. That's what we mean, loved ones, by saying that the body in most people governs the soul. Now, there comes a time, you remember, when the spirit is born of God. And it begins to send out some directions to the soul. But yet, the body is the most important force still in the personality. And so, the spirit tries to send out a little life, but actually the body still dominates. And that is the situation in a carnal person, you remember. It's the situation in a person who cries out, Romans 7 and 15, the good that I would I cannot do, and the evil I hate is what I do. And in that situation, even though the spirit is alive and the person is born of God, yet they still live their life by the power of the body. That is, uh, when they're too tired, uh, they don't get up to pray. Uh, the spirit is urging them to get up to pray, but the body says, no, no, you have the right to rest and you need to rest. Um, they are governed utterly by their domination uh, in, of food and their desire for food. So the Holy Spirit will prompt them to do something, but their desire for food will utterly govern. Uh, that's why, if you don't mind me saying it, brothers, uh, and I suppose sisters too, uh, we have trouble with the whole sex situation in that area. Because we're utterly dominated by our bodies. The body is still the big thing in our lives. And what the body wants, it must get irrespective of what the spirit wants. And in that way, the soul is still under the domination of the body, and there is really nothing of spiritual life coming out from the spirit through to the world. And that's the situation with the carnal person. Then there comes a time, you remember, when that domination of the body is crucified with Christ. And at least the body sinks down to a more normal size, but the soul then begins to take over. And still the spirit is small compared with the soul. And the soul begins to feed its old habits into the spirit. So now the body is no longer dominating, but the soul is. The soul has set up habits of operating that are due to its close connection to the body, and it still operates that way. It utterly overrules the spirit, and it completely, at times, disturbs the spirit. In other words, for years, 
the body has said to the soul, clonk, I'm being hit. Hit them back. So the soul hits back. So the old body for years has sent the spear there, and the soul has sent the spear right back. And even though the body is no longer doing that, the soul is used to that kind of activity. Somebody hits me, I hit them back. The little spirit is saying, eh, could you just cool it a little and wait? But the old soul is so used to it that it just keeps striking back. Now, the example of that, you remember, was in Mark 14. And verse 46. Mark 14 and 46. Here, the desire of Peter, because you can see in another gospel, it was in fact Peter that was involved in this instance. But uh, here, Peter uh, is utterly dedicated to Jesus and wants only Jesus' glory. So there's no question, you see, of wanting self's glory as it was back there. Peter wants Jesus' glory, but you see what happens in uh, Mark 14 and 46. And they, you remember the people who came to arrest Jesus, laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. So it was the soulish habit, whipping right out and striking right back. And that's what we mean when we talk about a soulish person. It's a person who, whose spirit is still being utterly dominated by the habits that the soul has got when it was once linked closely to the body. In other words, their lives are still governed by the soul, by the habits and the precedents that the soul has set up. Now, one of the effects of this, of course, is that because there is no division between the soul and the spirit, and because the soul is still the bigger of the two and the stronger, the soul manages to pass its disturbances on through to the spirit. So, Peter was all right while his spirit was quietly set upon Jesus with his eyes. And Jesus said, walk towards me. And Peter walked towards him, and he was in complete peace. But then his soul began to receive information from outside and began to hear the lapping of the waves and feel the wetness of the water at his feet. And immediately that happened, he lost the peace in his spirit, and he began to sink as his spirit eyes came off Jesus. And that's what happens to us when we're soulish Christians. We may be utterly clear of selfish will. We may be utterly committed to Jesus' glory, but our soul is still working in the old ways it used to. That's why we can go into the office on Monday morning, and we can have no desire but to glorify Jesus, and we ha can have no desire but to love those dear ones in the office. But they get going on an argument and our soul is not dominated by our spirit. It is instead still working from the memory of what it used to do with the body. And all that bickering and that conflict comes in through our ears, comes into our soul, and there is no division between our soul and spirit, and it passes all that chaos into our spirits. And our spirit, even though it is utterly at home with Jesus, even though there is no sin in our lives, yet our spirit becomes restless and disturbed. And of course, in that situation, we have no peaceful base, therefore, from which to minister to those loved ones. And actually, often, if you notice, we end up just responding the same as the rest. And have you noticed that you can get lost at times in political discussions in the office. Have you noticed that? In your own mind, you're absolutely settled that the kingdom of this world is not the kingdom of our Lord and of our Christ. And you are utterly satisfied that in a way whatever Jimmy Carter does and whatever the administration do, yet the victory in this world is dependent on God's kingdom and not the kingdom of men. And yet, people began to discuss politics in the office. And your soul goes out after what it hears through its ears, 
And without responding to your spirit at all, without even consulting this dear little spirit within you, your great soul responds immediately to what they're saying. And before you know it, you're in the midst of the argument. And have you noticed also that at times in the middle of the argument, you try to balance yourself. You, you try to say, wait, wait, I shouldn't be saying these things. I shouldn't be involved in this. But there's no quiet base within from which to gather your forces together and from which to get some information from God. And so in the midst of that chaotic situation, you don't initiate at all. You simply respond. And that's one of the big weaknesses, loved ones, if you are soulish, you find yourself constantly responding, responding. And so someone comes to you and asks you a question, one of those silly old intellectual questions that isn't their problem at all. And deep down in your spirit somehow, you sense something else about their lives that enables you to know that their problem really is a moral problem with God. But somehow the soul will not listen to the spirit. It's utterly dominated by what's coming through the ears, and so you respond to the intellectual question. And you get involved in a conversation that really doesn't go much anywhere, or if you are able to answer their intellectual questions, you don't sense that you've helped them in any way. And you leave them with a feeling deep down that there was something else you should have dealt with, but somehow you can't hear, you can't hear. And it's because your soul is not used to listening to your spirit. And of course, while that's the case, do you see, you will never achieve anything worthwhile for God. Because unless the spirit's guidance from within you can pass through your soul and through your body and out to the world, God's Spirit is never going to be able to touch the world because the ways of His Spirit are utterly different from the soulish ways we have of dealing with things. Now, that's plain if you look at some of the miracles in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua 6 and verses 1 through 7. Joshua 6 and 1 through 7. It's Page 189. Now, Jericho was shut up from within and from without because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho with its king and mighty men of valor. And the first move always of the Spirit is absolute faith that God has already done the thing, you see. See, I have given into your hand. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. And if old Joshua, you see, was a soulish person, he would say, uh-huh. Really? You believe that? He would, because no one would believe that walking around city walls six or seven times and blowing ram's horns are going to bring the walls down. Nobody would believe that. And do you see, that's the, that's the problem we get ourselves into when you don't train your soul to be governed by your spirit. Then you can't hear the spirit's directions. Or if you ever do hear them, they seem to you so ridiculous because your mind is still going on the old basis of the body information. And the old mind is working on the old principles. And do you realize that your soul and my soul has been trained the way all the other three and a half billion souls have been trained to live in this world without God? Do you realize that? Our souls are trained to live in this world without God. That's right. That's why when somebody is criticizing us in the office, 
Our soul doesn't have any sense that there's anyone to defend us but ourselves, and so it immediately responds by criticizing them or trying to insert seeds of distrust in them into the ears of our friends. We behave like little animals who have no God to defend them at all. So our soul is continually operating like that. Now, brothers and sisters, that's a big uh, thing to face, that your soul does not operate the way your spirit does. Your mind is an unrenewed mind. It operates on the old bases, and the old bases were, were founded on the assumption that there is no God to take care of you. And so your mind operates in an unrenewed way all the time. So it's very unfitted to hear the directions that the Spirit gives, which are given to a renewed mind. So do you see that the Spirit will always seem to be giving to you stupid directions? unless you begin to bring your soul under the control of your spirit. That's why some of us, at the very beginning of walking in the spirit, can't make sense of God's directions. We think, oh, that's ridiculous. And then older saints who have been on the way for years, we tell them what the spirit seems to have said, and we say, isn't that ridiculous? And they say, no, that's sure, that's the way God always works. And it's because their soul has begun to come under the control of the spirits and their mind understands and sees the sense of the spirit's directions. But you see, again and again, if we're soulish, we come to a Jericho situation, the Holy Spirit tells us, no, say nothing to your mom. Say nothing to your mom. I know, I know she doesn't understand why you think you should marry this person. I know your dad doesn't understand why you think you should go out in this career. I know that. But say nothing to them. Pray. Just share quietly with them. Don't argue with them. Just pray. But our mind rebels against that and turns back to its previous history of experiences and says, no, no, if my mind doesn't engage with their mind and I don't persuade them that I am right, then they'll never agree. And the Spirit says, no, no. The Father is sending angels to them and sending me into their spirit. And if you will back off and don't crowd them and just pray for them and love them and re re surrender the thing into my hands, I'll work in them. But the mind so often rejects that kind of wisdom because it is used to living by the body's directions on the basis that there is no God to defend us. And so you'll find the soul constantly finding difficulty with directions such as Joshua received in Jericho. And that means, of course, brothers and sisters, that the soul actually can never be used to minister Jesus' life, you see. Because actually what happens to most of us, even who are filled with the Spirit, is our soul will not listen to our spirit. And it instead passes on human wisdom and worldly wisdom. And that's why so many of us see so little fruit for our ministry. Because we're passing on just worldly human wisdom. We're not passing on directions from the Spirit. Now, there's another example, loved ones, that shows this plainly in Judges chapter 7. Judges 7. And you remember the Midianites were moving against the Hebrews. And Joshua chapter 7 and verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has delivered me. And... Uh, you might be interested in the numbers. We can check them up in a moment, but there were 135,000 Midianites, and uh, Gideon, whom God told him ha he had too many, had 32,000. And God said, no, no, you have too many, because if you win with that number, you may think that it's your own soulish power that has won the day. 
And so in verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. And Gideon tested them, 22,000 returned, and 10,000 remained. So Gideon was left with 10,000 to fight against this 135,000. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you. And of course you remember that God reduced the number to 300. Now, do you see that that doesn't make any sense to our human minds? <laughs> and we like to think, you know, oh, well, thank goodness that that was Josh. He had special anointing from God, or Gideon, rather. He had special anointing from God so that he could tackle this. Thank goodness that I'll never have to stop right there, because you will. You'll have to do exactly that repeatedly in your lifetime. Repeatedly, God will bring you into situations where he will ask you to go forth with his power and his grace alone. And what happens, of course, with most of us is we either don't go forward with him or we go forward with the soulish power. And we exercise that soulish power of ours, the power of our minds and the power of our emotions and the power of our wills. And we end up, of course, not achieving what God wanted us to achieve at all. In fact, we hardly pass ourselves. We just get through the experience and say, well, thank God that it was so short and that it's over and that I can learn again for next time. But brothers and sisters, it's God's will for us to begin to bring our souls under the control of our spirits. And it's God's will for us not to speak from our souls out. And that's what we're always doing. We're speaking from our souls out, both as husbands and wives, as brothers and sisters in the body, as friends and colleagues. We're responding from our souls out. We're never, in other words, people are not touching our spirits at all. They simply get as deep as our souls. That's what they hit. They hit the soul level. And the response they're getting is a soulish response. Now God's spirit is completely fresh. And you see, that's what happened at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. It was beautiful. Adam got up and God said, the orange tree is over there and orange juice is there. Just get some. And then I'll show you where to get the rest of your food. There's another fruit tree over here. I'll show you where to get it. And then after you finish breakfast, I'll show you what you ought to do today. Then he would finish breakfast and God would say, Now, you see that river over there? Now, it has to be diverted. Now, I want you to do that. So he diverted it. And then uh, Adam would say, Now, Lord, what's going to happen then when the floods come? And God said, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what to do when that comes. And so the floods came and God told him what to do about the river. But then Adam began to get a little independent and began to note down the things that God had told him to do. And he began to list the precedents and the laws and the regulations and the rules for governing the world. And that's what our souls are full of. Your mind and my emotions and our wills are filled with precedents and laws and rules and regulations so that we are little creatures that have just reflex responses that keep popping up. Somebody presses one button, a little reflex response pops out. That's what we mean by soulishness. And that, loved ones, is what will prevent God's Spirit ever dealing with us. Now, what has to happen is the powers of that soul have to be broken. They are strong. And so you have to have the breaking of those soulish powers. And before that, you have to be aware of those soulish powers, so there has to be a revelation so that you know when you are responding in a soulish way and when you're responding in a spiritual way. Now, some of us thought, ah, number one is easy to discover soulishness.